So we're talking about what did Jesus really preach? Anybody want to know what Jesus really preached, really taught? Because there's a lot of times people will say, really what this stirred me up is, is I've heard people say a lot of people uh, that are worldly people, that are carnal people, that are just saying anything so that, you know, uh, acting like they're experts on what Jesus said and they're not even born again. And they're, they're twisting the word of God. Because a lot of times people go, well, you know, God is love. Because if we say we don't like this or that's not what God says is right and proper, then they're like, no, you're not preaching what Jesus did. Pre Jesus preached love. Well, you've already found out from the three previous messages that was not his main theme, uh, and, and and he preached differently to different people. So I love this, and as I'm studying this, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I really never, I, I've, of course, I've known what the Word of God says, and I've picked out parts of it. And that's the problem sometimes is you do pick out parts of it. But if Jesus said, you know, that he would, you know, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and uh, all his righteous, but also in the same breath, he says something else. You know, uh, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, give them the other. If they take your coat, offer the other one. I mean, we don't preach on that one very much. Are, are y'all are you with me? I said, are y'all with me? And so you see that Jesus preached to the multitudes. Who's in the multitudes? Well, in the multitudes, there's just a, a group of people who have come to hear and be healed. And really, they've just come to be healed. They're not really, uh, honestly, that important to him what they're saying, but he makes them listen. And then they, they receive miracles and, and the lame walk and the deaf, uh, you know, hear and the mute speak and the dead are raised and people are fed, you know, uh, good sardines and crackers and everybody's happy. And then within that group, though, there's always Sadducees, Pharisees and scribes. There's always his disciples, and his disciples were not 12. It was probably closer to a thousand people that followed him on a very regular basis. Um, and then you see other times where uh, Jesus, uh, he, he'll talk back to. In other words, a scribe or a Pharisee, a lawyer of the law will say something, and then he's got a whole message for them. Because if they're bold enough to challenge him, he's bold enough to tell them what the word says on who he is and who God is really like. So he, there's many places that he's not really preaching a sermon to them, but he's answering their question. And so the deal is, that's why he told us, you need to have an answer ready for everyone who asks you. And you have to, Amen. all right, hallelujah. In other words, you don't have to let everything go, but we have an answer from the word, not your opinion. Not your opinion, but what you, I mean, Jesus answered back to religion. And so you and I got a lot of answers to that. And then the other group he preached to was his disciples. Sometimes it was to the 12. Sometimes it was to one of them. Sometimes it was three of them. Sometimes it was 12 of them. Sometimes it was 70 of them. And sometimes it was a whole bunch of them. And then another thing that I like so much is his one-on-one -on -one interactions. And so I've been going through, and I did it the way I felt like the Lord told me to. The first three messages I gave to you were those that he spoke to the multitudes. Um, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon in the Plains. I really love that. And, and there's more in there that I can, well, you left this out. But see, I can't do everything. I expect you can read too. Can't do everything. I'm just trying to do what the Holy Ghost is highlighting to me. And so that we all generally, but you ought to go back and read the Sermon on the Mount because it's all God and it's all speaking to all of us right now. You ought to read the Sermon in the Plains. What is that? That's the one that's not on the mountain. That was the one in the plains. That's why they call it the Sermon on the Plains. And then the Lord, I was looking at all this stuff. I'm like, Lord, you know, oh, what do I do? And then he told me for the rest of it to mix it up. So you never know what you're going to come in getting. Because if you think you're going to, oh, we're going to talk about what he talked back to the Pharisees, you may not get that. But today, this is what's on my heart. I want you to turn to Mark's gospel, chapter number five. We're going to look at how God repositions two non-covenant people. How I many you know when Jesus came to the earth, he said a lot of times, we're going to look at it, he said, you know, he came to the children of Israel. That's his assignment this time. He's getting them ready. He's getting them ready to be born again. These are God's covenant people. Yet they didn't know that the Gentiles would be added in. Are you grateful for that? That's all of us, mostly in the room. The Gentiles were added in. And yet, um, listen to this. I'm going to say it this way. Faith is faith is faith. And you see that even when Jesus was walking on the earth, if someone who wasn't in a covenant would hear his word, 
speak his word and do his word, release corresponding actions they receive from him. And it's the same way you and I do. But I love this because I watch the Lord and it's something that I love about him. Jesus repositioned those who came. They were coming the wrong way or something happened in the middle of when they came and he repositioned them. God is not trying to keep things from you. This is not supposed to be hard. This is not supposed to be hard. And the Lord wants you to have this. He's not a withholder. His hand is not closed, and you got to pry it open with your faith. His hand is open to satisfy every living thing. Do I got any living things in the room today? Does God want to satisfy you? Does God want to bless you? Did Jesus already purchase it? So let's look at this in Acts chapter, no, Mark, Mark chapter 5. Let's look in the, uh, we'll go King James first. Mark chapter 5, verse number 22. And they don't have my notes up there, so um, um, we'll catch up. Oh, but they're fast. And behold, there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue. Let's stop there. His name is Jairus. What, what is, who is he? He's a ruler of a synagogue. So what does that mean? He's a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or a scribe. He, he's somebody uh, elevated. This is his job. He's a professional teacher of the law. He holds a lofty position, but his, and his name is Jairus. And he says, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Verse 23. And he besought him greatly, saying, my little daughter who we later find out is about 12 years old, lies at the point of death. She's not dead yet, but she's almost dead. I pray thee, come and lay hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Stop right there. Faith comes by and hearing by. A rhema Christos, it's not just a logos. It becomes a, a revelation. You grab a hold of it. You believe it. There's some speaking involved. So this is Jairus telling us what he's heard. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, has heard that if Jesus will lay hands on a sick one, even one at the point of death, they will live. They'll be healed and they will live. Does Jairus believe that? Is he trying to get Jesus to do this or does he believe it? How do I know that he believes it? Number one, this is a confession of faith. This is not a confession unto faith, which I believe in, but this is a confession of faith. And what do I know? His corresponding actions took him as the ruler of a synagogue, could potentially lose his position, lose all of his finances, lose his position in the community, uh, be stoned to death, whatever it would take. He did not care. His baby was at home and she was about to die and he believed what he heard. So he went to find Jesus. And what happened then? Well, verse 24 says this, and Jesus did what? So what does that mean? When Jesus was on the earth, that means this is as good as done. As Jesus went with him, this is finished. No, no. In, in, in Jairus' mind right now, as Jesus is going with him, this is done. Because if Jesus will come lay his hands on her, no matter how close to death she is, she's going to be all right. Because that's what he believed. That's what he said. That's what he did. Now Jesus is didn't. Jesus is doing the same thing. Jesus is on his way. He's come to let. So Jairus is feeling pretty good about life right now. Now you know what happened. That woman who had an issue of blood, remember? She grabbed a hold of Jesus and stopped the whole process. And she got her healing, and Jesus said to her, woman, who, this, one, this woman instigated a miracle by grabbing a hold of Jesus' clothes because what she heard was, if you touch him, power will go out of him and you'll be healed. And then Jesus said, who touched me? Y'all remember that? The disciples said, everybody touching you, everybody touching you, everybody touching you. What do you mean, who touched you? 
And, this, and then Jesus, looking through the crowd, wasn't leaving. Jairus, though, is like, come on, Jesus, we got to go, we got to go. And then this woman tells all. Well, now, we don't have it all, but she, t- come on, we're not going to pick on the women today, but they do have more words than men. And if she told all, I'm thinking she went back to the beginning and said, you know, this is how it happened, and I spent everything. I went to this doctor, Dr. Frank, and I went to Dr. da 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 and da da I ain't got no money. And I heard about you, though, one of my friends came over for tea and cucumber sandwiches and it was and they told me this and I heard that you were going by and so I came here but you know I can't get out in public and so I had to sneak through the crowd and I even got down low and and I went and I touched your clothes and I was just going to walk away but you stopped me and so here we are Jesus (laughs) and Jairus is going we got to go How many know when you're, listen to me, I've done this a long time. Your thing is more important than anybody else's thing. We try to be gracious with that, and we should be gracious. But when you've got something going on, and it's a time thing. Because listen, what are his enemies? Time. One of his biggest enemies is time. And, and this is good for that certain woman. But verse 35 of Mark 5 says this, and while he yet spake. There came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, and we never get to know certain's name, but certain. And certain has a significance because this is not just in anybody. This is somebody that has the ruler's ear. Certain said, your daughter's dead. Now, I always bring this out when I teach on this, but he says, why trouble the master? Master is in King James. If you look in every other translation, you go back to the original word, it's teacher, instructor. Now, I don't know that this has a big deal here, but I believe this certain didn't necessarily believe what Jairus believed. Because he said that he said something else. So we'll come back to it. So, so but hold that in your thinking. And that as soon as, verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered, verse 37, no man to follow him except Peter, James, and John. And then so they come to the house and everybody is going crazy and she's dead and they were weeping. And Jesus said, what? She's not dead, but she's just asleep. And they laughed him to scorn and he put them all out. Everybody out of the room. Why? Because uh, you, you need, um, he was trying to keep the atmosphere full of faith. So he had Peter, James, and John, mom and dad, and him, and the Holy Ghost, and everybody else that got to get out. Um, I don't know, sometimes if you realize this, you can't always fight through everybody's doubt and unbelief. So you have to clear the atmosphere. If Jesus did, you did. If Jesus did, you do. The atmosphere is very important. You need an atmosphere of faith. That's why when you're alone in your car, that ought to be the best atmosphere you got. (laughs) When you're alone in your prayer closet or wherever you're at, that ought to be the best atmosphere. Amen. Now you need to get along, along with, y'all got to have four crazy friends. You, you can create a better atmosphere when you got people in the same direction. I love the atmosphere at our church because I believe it's conducive to miracles. Hallelujah. So we know that what happened. She got up, the 12-year-old lived. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at some key points. I want you to, no, number one, I want you to know this, that again, Jairus had to hear something. So how many times you got to hear something? Well, you got to keep hearing it. It's not what you have heard, it's what you are hearing. And Jesus said, be careful what you hear and how you hear it. So faith comes by hearing and hearing a rhema Christos. So you've continually got to hear the word of God. It's best for you when you read the word of God, study the word of God, and you speak it out loud out of your own mouth. And that confession unto faith will become a confession of faith. So he believed something. Again, he believed something. And because he believed something, he went and did something and he said something. And I, like I said, Jesus is on the way. So everybody say he is finished. Because in, in that's really right then it was finished. Was there any doubt that if Jesus could lay hands on her, the girl was going to live? There was no doubt whatsoever. There was nothing going to change that. But then suddenly we see this in verse uh, 35. And can I have that? Mark chapter 5, verse 35 in the Amplified Classic. Mark chapter 5, verse 35 in the Amplified Classic. This is where, where um, the, the certain man came. 
So Mark chapter 5, verse 35, Amplified Classic says this. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house who said to Jairus. So, so, so Jesus is finishing up with the woman. And Jesus is still talking. She did, he is probably just saying, and you, I, ooh, you got great faith, girl. And he's finishing up chatting with her. And then suddenly, while Jesus is still speaking, there comes a certain man from the ruler's house who said directly to Jairus, Jesus is still talking. Jesus can talk and listen at the same time, just like you can. And he said, your daughter has died. So now everything's changed. It's too late. It's too late. She's dead. Now Jairus has got a choice here. Does he get mad at the woman? Does he get mad at Jesus? Does he get mad? Does he get upset? Does he fall apart? Well, that would be all of my natural instincts, and it would be all of yours too. So let's not, just be, let's not be light about this. Because suddenly Jesus was on the way. He got stopped, and now she's dead. And then the certain. Now listen to me. When you, we don't think about this until we got a crisis in our life. But it is very important who you hang with. It is very important who has your ear. It is very important because this certain to me was not just in anybody. He was a certain. And so whether that was a personal assistant, whether it was another, uh, you know, within, he's the ruler of the synagogue. Maybe it's another teacher, another scribe, another Pharisee, somebody who's really important to him, who carries a lot of weight with him. He said, your daughter has died. Don't bother or distress the teacher any further. Jairus, so this is what I hear. Maybe you don't hear it. This is what I hear. This was a great try. I didn't believe it anyway. Don't bother him anymore. Don't bring him. We're all going to be all right now. I know she's dead, but we're going to be okay. We're going to keep the synagogue together. You're not going to lose your place. I'm not going to lose my place. Don't bother the teacher any further. Now, I may be reading into it, but, but I kind of know human beings and their security with jobs and their security with positions and how that's so important to them. And he's like, let's not bother him any further. And then I love this next verse. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Overhearing but ignoring. He's finishing talking. The certain man is telling him, don't bother the teacher anymore. Let's go home. And Jesus ignored the certain because he's irrelevant. Because he don't believe. He don't believe. He thinks he cares, but he don't believe. He ignored him. <laughs> Can you ignore unbelief and, and, and doubt? Well, you sure got to get rid of it. Don't talk to it. Don't cuddle it. Don't pet it. Overhearing but ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler. He said to Jair. He, in other words, he's like, I don't know. I kind of see him doing this. He, they're talking and he turns them around. And, Look at me. He said, don't be seized with alarm and struck with fear. Only keep on believing. Listen, fear is nothing to be played with. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Uh, Peter uh, was walking on the water. You remember Peter walking on the water? J he said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, come. So he walked on the word, come. He was really walking on the water, but he's really walking on the word. And he's walking on the word. And then suddenly, because he's a fisherman, and he realizes he's on the water, and even though there was a storm, he saw the winds boisterous, and the waves were hitting him in the face. And the Bible says that Peter grew afraid. And when he grew afraid, what happened? He began to sink. Everybody say, help me, Jesus. That's what he said, and he pulled him up, set him back on the water, and he said, uh, why, why did you doubt? Why did your faith only last a little while? He had faith. How many know Peter walked on the water? How many know that takes faith? Faith in the word come. It wasn't the amount of faith uh, that Peter had. It was the length that it lasted. It only lasted a little while. Your faith has to last more than just to start. Your faith has to finish you all the way till it manifests. It wasn't the amount, it was longevity. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd say something. You'd do something. Quit waiting until you arrive and start doing something. 
I'm going to tell you again. Quit waiting till you arrive and start activating your faith and doing something with your faith. You have faith on the inside of you. How many of y'all born again? Then you got faith. How many of you filled with the Holy Ghost? Then you got faith. Why? Because you already proved it. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. He'll always tell you you don't have enough. This one's too big. You need more faith. Do you need more faith? Absolutely. Does your faith need to grow? It certainly, it certainly does. But when Jesus said great faith, we're going to look, oh, I got to okay, stay here. Hallelujah. He said, don't be seized with, with fear. So fear can seize you. And when Peter had uh, fear, when he walked on the water, it caused him to fall. Fear is nothing to play with. Worry, worry is fear. Worry is fear. When you meditate in your mind how it's going to come out bad, that's worry. And then you discuss it with other people. That's a confession. That's what you believe. That gives the devil something to work with. Amen. Fear is an enemy. Fear is an enemy. I, if you ever hear yourself, well, I'm afraid that this is the you need to, don't slap yourself, but you need to say, oh, I don't believe that. You need to back that up and get some word in you because fear will uh, strangle. It will, uh, you can't have faith and fear working together. Not a little bit of fear, a little bit of faith makes you balanced. That makes you not receiving. So he, so what, so the thing, and now how many of y'all know Jesus understands us? If I got to report my little daughter was dead, fear would grip you. Disappointment would grip you. Anger might grip you. All those things, they're real emotions. But G, and, and then you got a certain, you got someone in your inner circle telling you, this is it. It is finished. It is over. This, we need to, we just need to go home. We need to go back to the way we were. Where everything's going to be all right. You're going to keep your job. I'm going to keep my job. We're all good. But then Jesus ignoring the doubt and the, uh, not doubt. Jesus ignoring the unbelief. And he said to Jairus, he said, keep on believing. What? Believing what? What you already said. Did he make a confession of faith? He did. Did he have corresponding actions? In that case, he did. You and I don't got to travel anywhere to find Jesus. He's living on the inside of you. But in that time, they, he traveled. That was an exercise of his faith, and he believed something. He said something, and Jesus was on his way, so as good as done. Now, you cannot control what comes at you, and in the time frame that it comes at you, you can't control when the devil comes. You can't control all the, you know, I know that people in our circle, they love to think that if I'll just say all the right things, I'll control everything, and it'll all be perfect, and nothing will get out. All the ducks will be in a row. That is wrong. That is not how this works. You can't control, because that means you'd have to control everybody. And your faith can't control other people's wills. And there are crazy people out there and crazy things. And there's a crazy devil out there. And there's just life. And you can't always control everything that comes at you. But you can always control how you respond to it. Jesus is helping him respond. In your marriage, you can't control everything that happens. You can't always, the feelings come and the feelings go, but how you respond is always very important. Everybody say respond. respond. And so this is what Jesus did. It can't be that time. Is it that time? I'm just getting going. He repositioned. He was headed the wrong direction. My pre-message, oh, that's where some of my time went. My pre-message God was trying to reposition somebody in the room. You can either listen and be blessed, or you can disobey and have it your way. That was worth combing your hair. Well, I just believe. What do you just believe? Have you heard from God? Do you have word on it? 
Or you just get to traipse and do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. No, you got to obey. Did I lose some of you? Hallelujah. Smile a little bit then. Hallelujah. You know, when stuff like that comes, if you just smile and say, hallelujah, pop the clutch, do some of those things, then you go home and fall across the bed. <laughs> I've learned how to do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> so during the meeting, I'm like, ah, oh, that's so good. And then you go home, oh, Jesus. <laughs> do it that way. Hallelujah. What's he doing? Everybody say repositioning. The Holy Ghost will help you. He's not against you. It's not supposed to be hard. But sometimes we're going the wrong direction. Fear is the wrong direction. Jairus already had it. But he letting what we would probably all do in that same circumstance, the circumstance change his faith. Well, that, Pastor Mark, does that mean that everybody who dies were supposed to raise from the dead? I don't know why I have to answer this right now, but no. You don't know is if you don't if you don't have a, a, a word from the Lord and the gifts of the Spirit in operation, you're not going to be raising anybody from the dead. But here we got Jesus in this example already said yes, so her dying didn't change that. The certain said it did, and Jairus was about to go with the certain, but thank God Jesus overheard, and he was talking to the woman. He ignored the certain. And said to Jairus, don't stop believing. Don't let go of your faith. Don't let go of what you've already said. And then Jesus went to his house, kicked all the doubt and unbelief out of the room, and raised her from the dead and showed Peter, James, and John how to do it. Jairus is already in faith. He's readjusted because Jesus and him are going. Jesus told him not to be afraid, so he's fully believing. I don't know what Mrs. Jairus is doing, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that Jesus let her in the room, so she's good. I guarantee you the certain wasn't in the room. Well, I know that because of who was in there, but the certain didn't get to come. You need to let go of some certains in your life. Hallelujah. Another woman that I adore. Well, that was a man. I love this woman. I love the Syrophoenician woman. You notice Jairus and the Syrophoenician woman came for their children. Their children were neither one present. Jairus' daughter, obviously too sick to make a journey. The Syrophoenician's daughter, um, too possessed to make a journey to Jesus. But they came. I, I don't have time to talk about this, but as a parent, you definitely have authority in your children's life. I would say even as they grow up, you're still going to be mom and dad. And even though some things change, you do have authority. And then you give, and then we all give certain people, we give people in our lives, and we ought to give people in our lives with spiritual a place in our lives, they have some authority. When you have a friend that you're telling them everything and you're believing together, uh, you're in agreement together, you've given them authority. Again, we don't have authority over people's wills. But these two people, Jairus and the Syrophoenician woman, both of them, I want you to see this, Jesus had to reposition so they could get their miracle. So let's start on this one. Let's go just for time's sake. Let's go to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verses 22 through 28. Let's do all amplified classic because I don't got time. Matthew 15. 22, and behold, a woman who was a Canaanite, a Syrophoenician from that district, came in with a loud, troublesome, urgent cry, begged, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is miserably and distressingly and cruelly possessed with a demon. Let's just stop here. We're just going to do it one, one at a time so that you can, uh, for time's sake. Number one, she's trying to come. This is a Syrophoenician woman. She has not got a covenant with the Lord. She is trying to come with what she's heard. Now, what she's heard, what does faith do? She hears something, she believes something. She has heard that Jesus can get rid of demons, and her daughter is grievously tormented. Now, how many of you know, I say this all the time, the daughter, no matter how old she is, I'm imagining, you know, an an older teenager, a young adult, but you don't go get possessed by a demon by walking in Walmart. Some of y'all to quit worrying about, you know, all these demons all the time. You're born again. Nothing can possess you. 
Now, it can mess with you, but you're not going to get possessed by walking through Walmart. She on purposely, her daughter yielded to a demon. On purposely went a certain way. Now she's grievously vexed, tormented. Her mama is upset and her mama hears about Jesus. And that's how faith came. And mama heard that Jesus can get rid of the demon with the finger of God and he is a man of authority. So she goes to look for him. But the thing she does is she approaches him on a covenant that is not hers. And so so she's loud. I don't know if she's imitating somebody, but she's crying. You know, the two blind blind Bartimaeus, you know, she might have been in the crowd that day. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, come here, what you want? And she thought, I'm going to go get mine that way. And then she came and nope. And and, And then she had a trouble with the ushers. The ushers were trying to send her. They're tired of her. So this must not have been a one-time thing. She must have been, like, troubling them. She thought, if I could just trouble him and be loud, he's going to stop and he's going to do something. And the, the disciples got irritated with her, and they said, let's get rid of her. They weren't having very much compassion that day. Verse 23, Amplified Classic. But he did not answer her a word. How many of that might be frustrating? He's not talking to her. So she's going to do what? And the disciples said, send her away. Because not only will she not leave you alone, she's bugging us. Send her away. If you're not going to help her, send her away. Verse 24. And he answered. Listen to me. Everybody say repositioned. So the Lord's not trying to keep you out. Now you have a covenant. But listen to me. Now, now everybody listen. Begging is not faith. You, as a born-again believer, should never beg the Lord to do anything. You don't need a box of Kleenex and tears to move him. As a matter of fact, I think that you will offend him. Well, I'm sad and I'm tired. Yeah, but get a box of Kleenex, wipe it up and smile and say, Lord, I know you hear me when I pray. You have a covenant. Your emotions, unfortunately, listen to me. Does the Lord care about your emotions? I'm talking to somebody. Does the Lord care? I made somebody mad just then. Don't get mad at me. Listen to me. He does know where you're at. He does know you care. But just because you have a problem doesn't mean you have faith for it to be fixed. He's moved with it. But he's so, so moved he died for it already. He already fixed it. I'm just telling you a box of Kleenex and your tears won't move him. Begging him is not going to change it. Faith will change it. He's going to do to you what he did to her. Everybody say reposition. Reposition. What did he do? He just had to move her a little bit. Not even he 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 ignored his disciples. Lord, she'd she'd send her away. He didn't. He then he started talking to her. He said, "I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Is that a truth? It is the truth. Was she one of them? No. Verse twenty-five. But she came. She's like, all right. So she came with what? Loud crying. She must have heard it, must have seen it. Son of David. What is that? Covenant. So Okay. So that's her first approach. First approach didn't go well. The disciples want to get rid of you. Jesus is not talking to you. And when he does talk, he said, I didn't come for you. So what did woman do? I love her. Jesus loves her. She did what? Reposition, reposition, okay. She came kneeling, got real, got real. Lord, help me. Okay, I see I tried to come the wrong way. You ain't having none of that. You can't help me with that. That's not my covenant, but Lord, help me. Listen to me. If something's not working, a Lord, help me is a good prayer. Because how many of you know the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus? This, well, if it's not happening, it just may may be the will of God. Well, that's just a bunch of baloney. That's just religious talk. Come on, the promises are yes to you and amen to you. God is not a withholder. Sometimes it's on us. We need to reposition. Everybody say, I'm repositioning. She said, Lord, help me. Everybody say, Lord, help me. 
What'd he do then? That's a prayer he can answer. Come on, we don't want to pray prayers he can't answer. Verse 26. And he answered, it's not right. We got more. It's not right, it's not proper, it's not becoming or fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, you know, the Jewish folk called the Samaritan folks dogs. Now, I say this all the time, but in today's culture, you call me a what? I ain't no dog. Let me tell you what you are. And do without? You got to be watching everybody trying to get you irritated and angry. My rights. Well, if you'll just stick with your rights in God, all that stuff will just go away. Hallelujah. He answered and said, it's not right. I don't care if you didn't like that or not. Hallelujah. It's not right, proper, becoming, or fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He just called her a dog. What is that significant? She's got an opportunity. Some Jewish man of how many ever Jewish man just called her a dog again. What does she do? She's there for her baby. She's on assignment. She's on mission. And I ain't moving from my mission. I'm not leaving until I get my answer. Call me whatever you want. And then I just love this woman's brain. I love, she's probably like my, my wife, Pastor Rhonda. She's fast on her feet, man. I love this woman's brain. I love how it works. She's like, okay, I came that way. That was wrong. Uh, so look, I got to get some help here. I got to figure it out. He just called me a dog. Mm, that hurt. Um, okay, what are we going to do here? Verse 27. And she said, you're right. But even the little puppy dogs. The little whelps, I like that, eat the crumbs. Lord, I don't need a loaf. I don't even need a slice. I'll take what they're not having. I'm taking whatever's falling off the table that everybody thinks is no good, and I'll take that. All I need is a little crumb. (laughs) Don't take a whole lot. It don't take a whole lot. One word from God will change your life forever. One word believed, one word acted upon will change your life forever. And then Jesus answered, what did he do? What did he do with this woman? His personal interactions with people, very different than his crusade ministry. Very different than his Uh, fix up the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. Very different even than his ministry to his disciples that he's training to lead. When he talks one-on-one, I love his one-on-ones. Aren't you grateful you can have a one-on-one with the head of the church, with the master, with the great teacher, with the creator, with the great I am? A one-on-one. When he was done with her, he said, Whew, you got great faith. Be it done unto you, just like you said. And her daughter was cured in that moment. So when mama went home, her daughter was back in her right mind. No demon. And I'll bet them two girls were waiting for the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And they believed on him. I'll bet that girl became a somebody. Come on, you're laying at home, you're all messed up, and then suddenly, your mama. The same Mother's Day, but thank God for the mamas who won't let their babies go. It's for me and my house. We're going to serve God. She held on. But you got to let the Lord reposition you. Why keep doing the same old, same old, same old, same old, getting the same old, same old, same old results when you know better? It's a simple prayer. Sometimes, now listen, 
if you're believing and you're standing and you know you're in faith, don't be looking like, why this don't work? Because that's, that's doubt. But if you, it, you know, if you really know, okay, I was trying to be in faith. You don't try to be in faith. You're in faith or you're not. And sometimes you just say, Lord, help me. Do I need repositioned? Jairus had to be repositioned because he was about to be afraid and listen to the certain. Be careful who you listen to. The Syrophoenician woman, my goodness. All them Jewish guys trying to get rid of her because she was a Samaritan woman without a covenant and she was harassing them. She could have left, and most people would today, just left offended, just left mad. You can't treat me that way. But she decided her mission was more important. And all Jesus was really trying to do was reposition her. And then he said something that we have preached on for some 2,020 years. This is a woman that has been elevated in the word of God because Jesus said, I haven't found this kind of faith around here in these parts with these covenant people. 